is um, Senator Cory Bernardi. Um, I believe he is the only politician in the room. Um, so he's so I'm quite excited to have the entire place to himself. Uh, so if, he has, uh, if you haven't enjoyed his handshake and warm smile, just give him 10 minutes and he'll be there shortly. Um, Cory was sworn in as a senator for South Australia in May of 2006. He has had more than 24 years involvement in the Liberal Party in Australia. He was one of the leading advocates within the Liberal Party, who stood against the Rudd Labor government's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And before entering politics, uh, Corey was a business owner and equity investment fund manager. He is the author of three books and recently founded the Conservative Leadership Foundation, a not for profit educational research and training organization dedicated to developing Australia's future leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Corey Bernard. Thank you, Jim, for that uh, very warm introduction. And may I firstly congratulate Heartland for hosting this, uh, this conference. I've had an association with the Heartland uh, Institute for uh, a little over a year now, and uh, it's great work they're doing. I'd also like to congratulate all of you for attending and showing enough fortitude and interest in uh, what is a very critical subject. There's no doubt that many of you will be subject to um, uh, some criticisms when you raise these sorts of issues or question the theory of climate change. Um, or anthropogenic climate change in the community. You'll get called names. In my own particular case, I have to remind people that Corey is a four-letter word beginning with C, but it's pronounced a little differently than um, they're talking, they're saying it to. Um, following Bob Carter, who's uh, been a wonderful advocate for uh, reality in this science uh, of climate change debate, there's a couple of corrections, Bob, that I have to, uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, firstly, there has been a politician who said he was going to stop a natural disaster. He was a flamboyant uh, South Australian Premier who um, said that uh, under threats of a tsunami swamping Australia in the uh, 70s or southern Australia, he would go out to the edge of the uh, Glenelg Jetty, which is the longest jetty I think in the metropolitan South Australian area, and stop the tsunami. Um, he went out there and he stood there and sure enough the tsunami didn't come, so uh, he's managed to achieve that. <laughs> The other point, Bob, where you, I have to correct you, unfortunately, is that there are climate experts in the world that cover every aspect of the climate change debate. You may not be familiar with them. They're self-appointed. They are all in the Greens party in the federal parliament, and they know everything there is to know about climate change, um, according to them. Uh, I introduced myself to the three new Green Senators the other day. Um, they were on the floor of the Senate chamber. I said, hello, my name's Corey Bernardi. I will be the greatest thorn in your side in the next three years here. They all looked at me and smiled and said, we know. Um, so clearly I'm doing my job, uh, which is great. Uh, look, I, I got into this, uh, I was elected to the Senate or appointed to the Senate in 2006. Um, and I got engaged in the climate change debate, not from a scientific perspective, but a common sense perspective. And I remember being in Melbourne and watching Sky TV, and I see Ian Plymer um, just over there. And I saw Ian Plymer on the Sky News, and he had a five-minute um, discussion or time slot in which he said, you know, the facts that are about climate change and uh, do not fit the theory that's coming out. And I remember ringing my political mentor and uh, great advisor, Nick Minchin, and said, Nick, you know, this is an eminent scientist who's prepared to put his rep professional reputation on the line. I'm in politics to make a difference. This is not a 50-year you know, career for me. Um, I'm prepared to take some risks and advocate for what I think is really important. And he said, well, you know, go for it. And I wrote an essay called um, Cool Heads Needed on, on uh, Global Warming. Uh, it met with um, front page headline, you know, Luke declares climate war. Uh, there was a response from my uh, long-standing um, uh, rival, Penny Wong, um, in which, uh, you know, the first of the names that I was called um, and have stuck with me ever since were published in the national press. I don't regret it, because it's all about restoring some common sense in this debate. You know, I'm not a climate change denier. Climate is changing, we've heard that, we know that it's changing, it is changing all the time. The question is, what's driving it? I don't buy the fact that carbon dioxide is the primary driver of climate change. Um, if it were so, the easiest way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions is ask everyone to hold their breath for about five or ten seconds every hour. Billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide would not be released in the atmosphere. And that's why we can all go green by turning blue. <laughs> 
But there has been a considerable debate about it, and it's, it's happened because of forums like this and individuals standing up and having a go. Uh, right now, that has changed public policy. You may recall that uh, just last year, there was a consensus on implementing an emissions trading scheme. This is a scheme that would transfer money from the wealthy, you know, uh, um, uh, wealthy part of the economy and the productive part of the economy to government for redistribution. It was a form of socialism, I have no doubt about that. It was dressed up as an environmental concern. Uh, the simple fact was it was going to make no difference whatsoever to the environment. And repeatedly we have asked the, the government how much is it going to change uh, the temperature by? There is no, no answer. How much will it stop sea level rise by? There is no answer. And so, fortunately, at great personal risk, a number of, uh, of politicians stood up and said, we don't want to be part of this. It caused an enormous instability in the Liberal Party. We, call them, we refer to them internally as the Troubles. Um, but the fact was, as a result of it, we had a party that was prepared to stand for common sense for our national interest <coughs> and say, you know, um, and call uh, call um, uncle, if you like, on uh, this entire debate. That left the government, the Rudd government, then to go to Copenhagen, where um, you know it was a complete failure and a disaster. It, they came back and recognised that they'd been exposed. And so, a few months later, the Rudd government um, dumped their emissions trading scheme policy. Uh, it allowed uh, the coalition to take a, a much uh, more imminent role, I guess, in, in entering the climate change debate and uh, the end result was the change of leadership in the Rudd government to Julia Gillard and an election result which you know was won by the Gillard government by the slimmest of margins, they are a minority government. That is how much the political landscape has changed in the last 12 months. Let me tell you ladies and gentlemen it's going to change a, a great deal more in the 12 months to come because our parliament, our senate will be dominated well, the balance of power in the Senate will be held by the Greens Party after the 30th of June next year. And that's something that you know, we should all be concerned about because the Greens are actually driving now environmental policy within the government. The government themselves have acknowledged that um, there is a, a political cost attached to pursuing a, a, a green or a, an extreme climate change policy agenda. That's why they dumped the ETS. It's why Julia Gillard promised repeatedly that there would be no price on carbon in a Gillard government. She said it repeatedly. She ruled it absolutely out. Then immediately after the election, she refused to rule that. When she hadn't won a majority in her own rights, she was still trying to cobble together a coalition. Um, she refused to play, and I quote, the rule in or rule out game. And uh, that started the negotiations. And then finally, when the Greens offered their support, there was some price to the support for the government. Um, uh, of, of that support around the climate change. And that was where they've now established a climate change committee. Now the climate change committee, I'm going to have to read some of this because um, it's quite extraordinary in terms of reference. It's one of those wonderful committees that uh, you can only join if you absolutely believe in everything that's going on there. Um, you have to be committed to putting a price on carbon. Now that's not how Parliament should work. If you're going to have a cross-party committee, you should have a committee that explores fully uh, the outcomes and the potential risks and, and, uh, um, and benefits of such a thing. So it's been established to consult, negotiate and report to Cabinet to provide advice on building community consensus for action on climate change. Um, the committee decision will be reached by consensus. It's not hard if everyone agrees that you've got to have a price on carbon. So inevitably, the outcome of the committee and the recommendation will be that there should be a price on carbon. Exactly in what form, we're not sure. Uh, the committee is established, and this makes this pretty clear, it was established on the basis that carbon price is required to reduce carbon pollution. Once again, the, this number of carbon and pollution creeps into the, to the vernacular. Um, and the committee is to consider mechanisms for introducing a carbon price. This is despite the fact that the Gillard government completely ruled out having a, a carbon price at any form. Um, it's going to meet uh, monthly, its deliberations are entirely confidential, so we will have absolutely no input into it. The um, coalition, of course, is not putting someone on the committee because uh, we don't believe that having a price on carbon 
is in Australia's national interest, and certainly we don't think it's actually in, it's in our environmental interest. We're more interested in direct action uh, on environment, and we'd like to see more trees, and we'd like to see cleaner water, and all of those sorts of things happen um, uh, in our community. And so that's how we're advocating that we protect and preserve our environment. Um, we also have a new minister in uh, Greg Combe, who uh, I'm not sure when there were some questions about the politics of climate change, I have no doubt that Greg Combe is a thorough professional. Um, his personal beliefs into uh, uh, the cause of climate change, I, I'm not sure of. But there were some questions about politicians and whether they do actually believe in what they say. Let me tell you that there are many Labor politicians and some who are in the Cabinet who don't buy the alarmist claptrap that surrounds this climate change debate. There's no doubt about that, but they are bound by the Cabinet solidarity and uh, the caucus solidarity. There are many in the Liberal side who believe the alarmist claims of climate change and that carbon dioxide is driving it. And we have these, these great discussions and debates and we hope that common sense overcomes some of the personal um, belief systems. And I say belief systems because once again the facts do not marry up to the conclusions that are drawn. And that's what drew me into this debate. As I said, I'm not a scientist. I'm drawn into this because I want to see good public policy. I don't want to see government get bigger. I don't want to see people pay, have to pay more tax for absolutely no reason. And I don't want to give rise to an entire industry of, of property rights. And I'm sure that many of, you, um, many of you share those concerns. Because nothing can be sure of that once a big new tax is implemented, uh, under whatever guise, it uh, seldom goes away. Well, not to my knowledge, I've ever seen too many taxes repealed on a, on a neg net negative uh, income for government. Um, the challenge, though, for all of us is how we reopen the debate, because we're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have a policy to put a price on carbon by the end of 2011, and that policy has every chance of getting through both houses of parliament in Australia, and that alarms me. And the only way we can stop it is to, to continue the campaign which, which you know, led to the destruction of the emissions trading scheme. So we have to question you know, the, the expense and the cost attached to it for everyday families because you know, people do tend to vote on their hip pocket. But we also actually have to start to expose more fully from a political sense the science uh, and the frauds and the misleading uh, examples and the disingenuous conclusions that have been drawn from science right around the country. Now, historically, or previously, politicians have said, no, we will we'll talk about the, you know, the, the implications of the public policy, but we'll leave the debate to the scientists. We can't do that anymore. And with all respect, it's because scientists argue with each other. They talk to each other, and they debate points and technical points. And the public's not that interested in technical points. It takes a long time to get that across. What we actually have to do is take the very essence of what some of the things we've heard today and some that we will, and we need to package it up into those neat political sound lines. And not, that's not to be flippant, but we just have to put it in a, in a context that the Australian people can understand. We have to say there is no environmental benefit. We have to expose the, the, the flaws of the, of the IPCC conclusions and the methodology that's gone into it, the rent-seeking of, of the you know, alternative energy industries. We have to make sure that people are aware of the funding sources that go into some of these um, alarmist schemes. <coughs> we have to make the point that you know, Tim Flannery gets $50,000 a speech and Al Gore gets $125,000 a speech. That, you know, some of the, the people who are alarmed about sea level rise are buying waterfront homes. The fact that the Greens have their, you know, their office on the waterfront in, uh, in Tasmania. You know, how serious are they? I said, why, why don't you have it on the eighth floor just to be safe? You know, <laughs> you know, these are the sorts of things that we have to be prepared for. Now, I'm not a scientist. I, I need to draw upon, as do my colleagues, the work that is done by organisations like Heartland and the Climate and Bob Carter and Christopher Addison and all of, all of the other eminent people that are very skilled in this. And we've, I've got to, my role, and I hope you will share it with me in this, is to distill the essence of these arguments, put them into something that the, people, the Australian people can understand and make them aware of you know, the reality of this circumstance. And that's why it's so important that so many of us are in this room. And many of you will have many questions about how we can do it, and you might be interested in the current, you know, the political climate. But we, and I'm happy to take those in a moment, but we have to get that happening in the parliament. 
And yesterday, a friend of mine, uh, Dennis Jensen, who is a scientist and probably the only one, I think, in the, uh, in the Australian Parliament, um, ha and has been very active in this debate, called for a Royal Commission into the science of climate change. As I said, previously politicians haven't wanted to touch on the science, but I think we now need to do it. Whether a Royal Commission is the best way, and some people have discussed with me they think it is, or whether we should have a Senate Select Committee into the science of climate change, we need to start the public discussion to, to let them know there is no consensus on this. That some of the alarmists are profiting enormously from their investment in the alarm. That there is a, an entire industry dependent on it. The alternative energy industry. You know, there's many organisations that are entirely funded by it. The WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, and Greenpeace, Sea Shepherd organisations, the Greens, they wouldn't have anywhere near the amount of money that they get, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, if they didn't come up with increasing, increasingly um, apocalyptic scenarios in regard to climate change. And that is the mission. It is the mission to debunk these myths. And it's the mission that, uh, it's one of the many missions I've undertaken. I've got a few, um, a few challenges on my agenda, but we cannot afford to let this go to sleep anymore. And the problem we've had over the last six or seven or eight months since the Rudd government ditched their emissions trading scheme is that people think it's been dealt with and it's done. It's not. It's back on the agenda. I said at Heartland at the fourth uh, International uh, Climate Change Conference that you know, the emissions trading scheme and the response to carbon is injured and it's limping along the floor. It's our responsibility now to, to actually crush it and make sure it doesn't happen here. And if we can do it here, and the political environment is, is a great opportunity for it, because what we did here uh, you know, 10 months ago changed in some small way what happened around the world. It inspired some American people to, to stand up and say, well, look, the Australians didn't fall for this. It inspired some people in Copenhagen to say, well, we'll act when other countries act and no one's going to be doing anything because, you know, it's about time we acted in our national interest. And quite frankly, our national interest is served by not having a price on carbon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sure there are many questions. And really, uh, this is an opportunity uh, to ask a politician any question you like. I'll try and answer them as frankly and honestly as I possibly can. Um, and I say that advisedly because uh, I get into trouble whenever I'm too honest, so I've got to be very careful <laughs> in how I, I, how I uh, count it. But do you, are you happy if I just ask me questions from the floor? Sure, if you don't need a bodyguard, I'll I don't need a bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'd like, I may well do if I continue some of my yeah, pursuits. I'm, I'm here, just give me a signal. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I, I gather that in India and China have no plans at all to introduce any sort of carbon tax. So given that scenario, uh, how much influence has Australia got? Well, you know the statistics. Australia's going to have you know, no impact on global carbon emissions no matter what we do, essentially. What I'm advised in China, and it's very hard to get accurate details out of China, it's very easy for a, a centralised government to say we're going to cut carbon emissions by X amount and then absolutely nothing happened at the domestic level. And indeed, that's the feedback I've had. I've had that you know, the industries are still growing enormously. Um, they say, yes, you've got to have a, a, um, a I'll, say, I'll use the term sequestration technology or something to reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, but these factories actually don't turn them on. They've all got them installed, whether they work or not, but they don't turn them on because it, it's expensive to do, and they've all got these budgets and money to make. So there's a, there's a very big difference between um, political words and reality. Uh, you may be familiar with some of that just straight into on occasions. Yeah, George. Now, Corinne, <coughs> given what you mentioned and the fact that we all know that the numbers in the lower house and the Senate are as they are, and given that you say the committee's going to report and introduce a carbon tax, how is it possible, even if the next election totally turns around, how is it possible to stop the carbon tax between now and then. Um, well, there is a possibility it wouldn't get through the lower house. It's a very slim one because the independents have, have suggested they, they support it. Uh, it's public pressure. Irrespective of what the you know, outcomes of the, of the government are going to be, um, or their, their committee, public pressure will determine whether you know, it's acceptable or not politically. Uh, even if it were implemented at the end of 2011, um, it would take a 12-month period or thereabouts to to you know, come to, into operation 
uh, from a policy standpoint and an impact, and we would go to an election, you know, based around that. But in the meantime, there is, by exposing the flaws in the science, we can then debunk, you know, the conclusions that have been drawn and the base which is underpinning the government's uh, formula. The number of times that Penny Wong, when she was the minister, answered in the Senate and referred to the IPCC, it's what Chris said about the appeal to authority, um, it would normally followed by, you know, a new evil climate change denier, Corey Bernardi, and Nick Minchin and a few others. Um, you know, that's, that was, that's their whole reason for being. They defend their positions based on the conclusions that are drawn internationally. And that's why an examination of the science is so critical now um, for, and, and packaged so it's, it's you know, understandable to politicians because it has advanced so much and there has been so much discredited about the IPCC and the political process that's there. So by doing that, by sticking together and getting that real grassroots movement, picking up the work that so many scientists are doing and, and once again communicating it, that will make the difference. And in that regard, at a, I'm in a conference in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll be announcing you know, a small contribution in that regard to try and coordinate it nationally. In this thing. Yeah. Great speech, Corey. It's good to see you here today. Uh, just a quick point about China. A lot of people don't know that the main renewable they use over there are, is hydroelectricity, which is, of course, the, the opposite of what the Greens want. So that's a, a quick comeback to the mention China. Before, uh, big business. Uh, I like your opinion about what Poppers said the other day and also um, uh, the coal industry being in bed to a certain extent with the Labor government with respect to clean coal, which we all know about and doesn't affect the work. I'm not here to talk about coalition policy, That's, that would be the first thing I'd say, but uh, in regard to big business, a big business has to work with the government of the day. Uh, is it a coincidence that the three big mining uh, companies gained effect effectively exemption, <coughs> exceptions or exemptions on this uh, big mining tax the uh, Labor government wanted to introduce for their existing projects um, and then one of the executives comes out and says, we need a price on carbon. Um, that wouldn't affect him, because this is the essence of it, and I said this on Sky News, is that Mr. Cloppers wants a price on domestic carbon use. Um, BHP export most of their coal, uh, so he wants an exemption for that. Um, so it's okay for us to send coal to China and for them to burn it, but it's not okay for us to burn it here. Uh, this is, uh, the other thing that I, I've raised the question is that um, BHP are the largest uranium miner in the world and um, certainly whilst I support the steps towards a, a nuclear energy industry in this country, uh, I'd suggest that the more he can devalue coal in Australia, the only alternative base load energy is nuclear and that plays into his hands as well. Um, in, in stock market terms, uh, he was talking his own book, uh, which is what people do when they're trying to convince other people um, about you know, the merits of their business like that. So big business has, I regret this, that I don't think big business has played a very straight bat uh, in the climate change debate at all. And in fact, on the committee that the Rudd government, uh, the Gillard government, I keep forgetting, uh, has formed, um, there are, uh, there's Professor Garno, who of course wrote their report, who was also I think the, the chairman of a gold mining company, and there's an investment banker. Um, the, the people who, who stand to gain the most out of a carbon tax are those in government, those who live off government, um, or those who are going to trade, you know, in a carbon market. Um, so, and people like Mr. Clock. Boring. Yes. May I introduce myself? I'm a director of the Body Group. Fine groups. And to go up to that, I just want to thank you for your efforts to support the group, but. All of this talk is due to scammers. It's all based on CO2 turning the atmosphere into a furnace, which it won't. And people think that just by doing something in one part of the world, it affects weather all over the world, which is absolutely crazy. Are we living in a lunatic asylum? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't finished. <laughs> uh, I found that in a men 
immense amount of scabbing going on for the last 10 or 15 years. And of course, in the end, it's like a, a fire that's been started, and you've got to keep on putting them out. As uh, the leader of the, the Bosnia group said the other day, when we hope had to have a carbon tax, he sent out a memo to us all, one swore unto the breach, dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot to say and closed the walls up with our English dead, but that's the fun. But really, we're all here because of scaremongers. And I'm afraid that we've just got to keep on going because they love to be scared. <laughs> At any rate, as you know, we're supposed to gather together in Mexico at a place called Cancun. And there, we are supposed to agree to that and hand over everything to the United Nations. Well, they didn't in Copenhagen, and I bet they won't bother to do it in Cancun, even if they go there. But there are a lot of other things that have been touched on today, which are all due to the idea that CO2 is causing all the problems, which it isn't. And if you have a look around the world, all the efforts made in Europe and partly in America to reduce CO2 or emissions has made no effect at <coughs> all on the time. Quite right. And this is just so ridiculous. And this goes on in all sorts of ways. And you've heard of it today with regard to sea level rises, very well stated. And also, so, uh, I know there's a number of questions. I'm happy to talk to you yeah, about this after. To finish up. Can, that's right. I, I want to have a chat to you after. You can see we're done. I hope you all got coming. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Much more succinct and eloquent than I'll ever be. Can I, so, you're absolutely right. There are two great motivators in this world fear and greed. Um, you know, the climate change alarmists profit. From the fear, and so that's what's driving the debate. I have no doubt. Yeah, Corey, uh, this obviously is a very serious matter. The likelihood that we'll get a carbon tax foisted on us. So we really need to turn our attention to how to handle this. And if you look back over the last 12 months, uh, a small group that got really stirred up uh, about Turnbull getting into bed with Rudd. Um, almost got you guys re-elected within a whisker. We've got a change in the Senate uh, situation next July. There isn't a lot of time left. There's one approach which I'd like to talk to you about separately afterwards, but could you suggest how what we can do, and particularly the, uh, people, all aspects of it, the, the credible scientists and others, what do you need, um, and along with, say, Dennis Jensen, to tip this thing overboard while we've got time? Because if we don't, we're in serious trouble. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent question. Uh, it is really about establishing what I would call a clearinghouse of information, where, where the scientists can put in the latest information and it can be distilled and broken down into bite-sized chunks that come along there. Um, I see there's lots of questions on the in a second. Uh, and then that information can be disseminated in the best possible way. And that you know includes, it's, it's grassroots politics. It, it's got to be done with the internet, it's got to be done with email and talk back and letters to the editor and, and all of that so that, that so that the claims around the place do not go um, undisputed. And because on your website, let me just interject your um, I went and promoted your website and you came back to me and said you've seen a kick up in the hits. People are interested in this and that's the kind of thing that really helps. Well, in a, in a couple of weeks I'll, have, uh, I'll be able to disclose some other things about how it will help us all to get down that path. 
lots of questions, so we'll keep them short. And just, just, real quick, yeah. just real quick, I'd like to interject when the, the gentleman about the uh, uh, clearinghouse of information, greatly needed. But to grasp those uh, people in the middle, maybe we have to recraft our message like the Labor Party people, the progressives always do, are changing their language. Maybe we change our style and interject a little humor. That's all I'm saying. I, I, and I the agree with that. The absurdity lends itself to humor. Absolutely, it does. And, and there's many ways in which you can put it. This is the thing. If we get, I mean, we've all got a different way of communicating, and we have a different constituent base, um, you know, both the organizations and individuals. And so we need to get a clearinghouse of the ideas and information so that people can take it and represent it in their own language, in their own terms, make fun of them, make, mock them, deride them, right. um, you know, have a, a decent straight up argument with them. One of the interesting things I went to Get Up, um, which Bob also had, is he, and Get Up is a left wing, you know, organisation. I went there to be the sacrificial lamb. And one young lady came up to me was shaking, and I'm not sure if it was fear or rage. But she said, do you know who I am? And somehow I said, are you the lady who emailed me about a year ago? I emailed back and you were quite rude. She says, you were rude. And I went, well, that's because you know, I don't buy your stuff. And she says, I really hate everything about you. But I think, thanks for coming. <laughs> so, there's a whole different way of getting to different people. Yes, sir. Australia's competitive advantage is driven by you know, an abundance of mineral wealth, cheap power, and we've got 400 years worth of coal. Uh, we should be burning it, otherwise we're not going to have electricity in this country. There's no doubt about that. The coalition is committed to, um, you know, obviously more energy efficiency if it's possible, but we're not going to stop uh, the, the construction of coal-fired power stations because they're necessary. Uh, yeah. Corey, um, one of the cheapest places to advertise is in the regional press and media. It seems to me there might be an opportunity to really go to town on the electorates of the independents yeah. and try and persuade yeah, hearts yeah. and minds yeah. so that the pressure on the independents from their constituents is such that they really won't support the government's scheme. Yeah, look, I agree with that. There is an opportunity there. One of the independents, and Tony Windsor, has said he's concerned about the impact on food prices of any price on, on carbon. So whatever concerns there are in particular regionalities or with individuals, we should be you know, highlighting those issues. So independent media, I think, is and regional media is a good his, strategy. He sold his farm. To he did. He made it. He sold his farm to a coal miner, but he's against coal yeah, mining on prime land. Yes. Oh, Corey Charlie, here, right? Fellow liberal. Two two questions. One, the, in the uh, carbon tax, when it's implemented, is it reversible? And two, knowing that. Uh, if the electorate gets to know what the Greens are all about, it will be you know, not in their favour. Is there any advantage in waiting for uh, them to take the Senate 
control of the Senate to let the Australian public know how they really are and see the implications, and maybe short-term pain will be worth the long-term gain. Um, it's, it's a big risk. I'm going to take the first one. There's not waiting for them to take control. They're going to take control. It's, it's, it, there's an inevitability about that, and they will have the balance of power unless the coalition sides with, with, the, with the government. Uh, and they will drive their agenda. The, the Greens then have two options. They can be their mills themselves um, or, and pursue their radical agenda of death taxes and carbon taxes and all these other taxes and reduce families to you know, just another interest group. Um, or, or they can try and you know, reposition themselves and broaden their appeal. Uh, either way, it's fraught with danger for them and for the Labor Party, I would, I would think. Um, the, the other issue of the carbon tax, don't get me wrong here, what I'm going to say might sound like some heresy to you. A carbon tax is far preferable to emissions trading scheme. Um, uh, because, if only because it can be undone. Like other taxes, it's about the will of the government and the parliament say, no, we're not going to have that anymore. The emissions trading scheme gives rise to tradable property rights that you cannot take away without billions and billions of compensation. Um, it's also the fact that, you know, if when, when this is debunked, in the public mind, uh, that it's all a, a global scare and a big fraud, um, that you know you can demand the removal of it. So I, I would rather not see it implemented. I would be under no bones about that. But it is a preferable scheme, depending on how it's implemented. But you know I want to avoid that. So we've got to mount the pressure in the public campaign now. So yeah, I would like to say that I um, get the feeling that most people here are in the sceptic bracket. Now, uh, uh, there are too many such events which are attended by the converted. What each one of us has got to do is to single out all the people we know or people we come across who are alarmists and convince them otherwise. Mm. Yeah. And I, I hope you all personally experience that shaking with rage of I hate you the Yes, sir. Um, just before the ETS was voted on last time, uh, someone in the Senate organised Bob Carter to go and address a few people. My understanding is it wasn't very well attended. Um, and I was just wondering, since you are obviously supportive of people thinking about the issue, and Tony Abbott's called global warming crap, there must. But you've said yourself that there are people who are unconvinced and who are concerned about the alarmist message. Um, have has the coalition? availed themselves of articulate scientists like Bob Carter and so on to, to address their body because it would be at least good if there was cohesion within that group right. and you know people like yourself would play a good role there. Right. There is cohesion in the coalition because we don't support an emissions trading scheme or, or a carbon tax, that's our policy right now. Uh, I went to uh, Bob Carter's uh, presentation in Parliament and it wasn't well attended. You have to put it in the context of, of the environment. You know, we were part of the Mandy group. It's only the crazies and the, and, the, and the fools were speaking out against, you know, this great moral challenge of our time. And so there was quite literally a, you know, a handful, or maybe a dozen, um, uh, hardy souls that were prepared to do it. And there were journalists, you know, yeah, well, who, who are the kooks that are in there? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you wear some flack about it. I, I celebrate the fact, you know, I was out there very beautifully um, uh, enjoying it and saying I would not worship at the altar of green witchcraft. And, and you know, you can imagine how that went down. Um, but we have also, there is a group which I organise in Canberra um, uh, around my Conservative Leadership Foundation in which we invite people up to speak to members of my colleagues who are interested. Uh, we asked Ian Clymer, who donated his time, and. Um, came up to do that. We had 40 odd people there from the coalition, I think, in, and um, the change that was in some of them, many of us were converted already, but there was a group of people there that were genuinely interested and were swayed by the presentation of the environment. Now, you know, for me, it's about my personal resources going into it and trying to, to get people up there to explore issues that I feel strongly about. This is one of them. Um, I have no doubt if you can get the right speakers. Uh, and create the right environment. It's got to be a safe environment. That's one of the issues for politicians to extend their knowledge. It's um, which is it's a good a good opportunity. And uh, I'd invite you know if we can arrange for more of that, we will. Please um, use Christopher Adams. Oh well, I'm quite yeah, right. I'll do that. Beautiful presentation. I, that's at the level of what you're. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree. And I'll take that up after. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, in, ter in terms of. Uh, 
legislation that might pass and the Greens dominated. Is it, is it possible that they would pass a bill fixing the tax rate for years in advance? I mean, you, you suggested that the great thing about the tax is that you can rescind it quite easily, but I would think they would try to lock it in. Uh, is that not a risk? Is it, if we, we pass it now, and it goes through the Greens, it's going to get down, because Greens will dominate the Senate, or Greens plus Labour will dominate the Senate for 10 years, probably. Uh, yeah, that's a real, it's a real risk. Uh, they could introduce anything, but of course the parliament could repeal it. You have to have the numbers in order to do so. And the only way you could do that is to make it, um, if it was dominated by the Greens in the Senate, would be to have, uh, by the Greens in the Senate, would be to have public pressure demand it, or to have a, a, a you know, change in the composition of the Senate to get down that path. Um, it is a risk, but nothing is irreversible. It's just the cost and the price of reversing the decisions. Um, it's much better not to have it implemented in the first place, Alan. I'm sure you agree with that. Did, there was a question, yes? Could I ask a question and make a suggestion? The question is, do you have a strategy to deal with the ABC? <laughs> 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 I, I, <laughs> the suggestion is, every time you hear the words carbon pollution uttered in the parliament, you should challenge that speaker immediately to declare what he actually means for them. Is he talking about the ring on his wife's finger? Or is he talking about carbon dioxide? Yeah, that's a good idea. I might, um, I might actually do that at the next, uh, the next range of Senate with you, so a couple of weeks' time. And that, what can I do about the ABC? What can you do about the ABC? <laughs> it's like walking into the, you know, um, a, uh, a hostile environment. I did remark to uh, Tony Jones once, uh, when I was going on q and I, I said, Tony, you know, I'm ready to get out there and get booed. He says, oh, you might be surprised. I said, no, no, if I, if I don't get booed and heckled by the ABC audience, I have to examine my conscience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I maintain that now. Have we got time for one more? Tip? One, one more. Uh, sir, you've been waiting very patiently. What proportion of uh, members of the government are sceptics? Do you think? Uh, and is it possible to get at them and have, you know, get them to come out? Um, uh, I'd say it's a, it's a distinct minority when they say about sceptics. There are people who don't believe that a price on carbon, but they do believe, you know, man destroy the planet. Do they all believe in climate change? Uh, they all believe in climate change because you can't dispute that the climate is changing. It's I mean, the cause yeah, of it. I mean, but um, but man, look, I, I can say that there are, there are in the cabinet, there are um, certainly four that I know of, and, um, you know, the, whilst it's confidential because they, yeah, they have conversations with you that are private, um, and you don't want to disclose that, but you know there are interjections across the uh, the, the chambers, um, and occasionally you'll see them on a plane reading a book by Backlife Klaus or something like that, which is always uh, encouraging. But look, it's it's they're not going to they're not in the winning position now, and and Labor solidarity is such that you're unlikely to carve them off on this issue. Now I hope common sense prevails in many more of them, but the only way you get the attention of many people or to get their opinion changed in, in political life is to have public pressure applied to them. And we saw that in the Liberal Party. You'll see if you live in a Labor marginal seat, if you're a representative of a Labor, Labor marginal seat, and this is the big push button issue for you getting re-elected, you're not going to, uh, you're going to have a much stronger voice in the party room. So I would say that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's great to be much. Thank you, Court, for your great presentation and indulging so many questions from the audience. Um, I wanted to actually contribute very briefly to the conversation. Uh, somebody had mentioned, well, the great idea of uh, having a clearinghouse of information where there's even some humor involved in getting that. Independently, obviously, up in Chicago, we've been working on um, a site on the website for exactly that purpose. Um, it's got an operating aim of, you know, the global warming flow chart where you, it's very interactive. You can go in and there's ways to make fun of Al Gore, and there's you know, more serious stuff. There's a the science, there's the politics, there's um, uh, different subcategories, and, and when it is, I would love to give you the URL that's almost ready, but I'm in a fight with my boss on the proper URL for that, so I can't even discuss that. But when it is ready, um, partly we'll make an announcement, um, and I will have a sign-up sheet, actually, on the front table. Um, people can just leave their name and their email address. Uh, we'll be sure to make sure you guys get, um, get, get alerted to that, that fantastic website. It's already, I've seen, the dummies of it look fantastic already, and it's going to be ready to launch uh, probably within the next three, four weeks. 
Um, and also, um, Peter over here mentioned that you know this room obviously is almost fully populated with people that agree with the presentations that are happening here, and that skeptics tend not to even show up. Um, I have to say, for Heartland's International Climate Sub Conference change, uh, Climate Change, um, it was only at the fourth one that we had in May in Chicago that we finally got some uh, warmists, as we call them, brave enough uh, to show up. And in fact, they gave presentations. And at the end, one of the one of the warmists. Uh, came up to to, to us and, and said um, for the, the big plenary you know goodbye um, uh, discussion with everybody that was there. May I? And Corey probably remembers this. If you stick around to the end, he says, you know, may I give a, a, a some brief remarks uh, to the entire assembly? And President Joe Bass, I, I could hear this. They were talking to him. He's like, well, sure, you can do this. You can do this. And then Joe sits down at the lunch table next to me, and I said. I smell a rat because <laughs> the cameras are rolling. He's probably going to try to make a big scene. Far from it. He he stood up there and he he said he was surprised and amazed at how well he was received. You know, he's one or there were two skeptics in a sea, or two two warmest in a sea of skeptics. He was he was treated with respect. His presentation was listened to with respect. Um, he loved being challenged, um, and it seemed to think that he was starting to rethink the whole idea of you know, it wasn't rethinking the whole idea of global warming, but was appreciating the fact that there are serious people out there that have a contrary view, contrarian view based on science. Uh, so it was great. And we, we have invited um, warmest every single year, although we don't put warmest in the invitation, but we do invite them to come. Uh, and so we will continue to do so because that's what we really need um, in the dialogue. Um, so thank you. And then with that, um, uh, we're about to have our break before lunch at noon. And uh, Alex Stewart, are you here? Yes. Uh, he has a brief announcement. He has promised me it would be 60 seconds, and I have the hook, so he'll make a liar out of me. Thank, thank you, Jim. Australian Environment Company. Uh, I want to publicize an event that will be held in uh, Brisbane in, two weeks from now. It will be opened by Senator Cory Bernardi. It is the annual conference of the Australian Environment Foundation. Um, we uh, are a, an evidence, a membership based body that calls for uh, public policy to be based on evidence. And we, we uh, range a little bit wider than simply global warming. We're, uh, we're ahead of the curve. We have been ahead of the curve on nuclear policy in this country. We've been ahead of the, the, uh, the curve on genetically modified foods. Our founder, J Dr. Jennifer Marahasi, will be talking on gr the Great Barrier Reef. Um, one of my co-directors, Dr. Peter Ridd, from James Cook University will be talking on uh, climate modeling. Um, so if any of you would like to uh, attend, please look at our website, aefweb.info. If you can't remember that, please approach me and I shall uh, be happy to, uh, to uh, clarify it for you. Uh, it is well worth attending. Uh, in previous uh, previous annual conferences have been addressed by Dr. Bob Carter, Dr. Chris DeFritis, um, and other eminent um, um, experts in, in relevant fields. So it's two weeks, two weekends from now, that's the weekend of October the 16th and 17th, at Ridge's South Bank Hotel in Brisbane. So please uh, see me or my co-directors uh, uh, Max Reese or George Snow, and uh, let's uh, see if we can uh, whip up a bit more enthusiasm. Thank you.